This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast for the 9th of February 2016, a podcast about Apache Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anyone working with or investigating big data. My name is Dave, and here is my co-host, Yon. Hey, Yon. Hi, Dave. So, what have you been up to over the last couple of weeks? Uh, last couple of weeks, I've been busy not as much with customer visits, but preparing masterclasses. We're actually in the uh, in the workings of making two sets of masterclasses. One's in full swing now. We had delivered the first one, and uh, three more to go. And that's a masterclass on Apache NiFi, actually. So that was uh, a lot of fun. I mean, it was very good to have the interview with uh, Joe in my head when I gave the masterclass. So that way, I was able to answer all the questions. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> And the other masterclass is one we're planning to do in March, so still uh, about a month away. And that one's going to be on drumroll Spark, finally. So that's taken up a lot of my time. Uh, what else have I been doing? Oh, we've talked to a big, um, how do you say this in English, a train company? Yep. And they're actually looking again NiFi to install NiFi on the trains to uh, just like the airplanes are doing when they land in the airports, they dump all their data and they want to do the same thing with stations and everything. So that should be a very nice NiFi deployment if it happens and it's looking very good. So that took up a lot of time as well. And uh, of course, there's one more thing we have to talk about, but I'll be nice and I'll leave it up to you. You talk about your two weeks. So, last two weeks, lots and lots of meetings, uh, but uh, also spent a bit of time on the podcast and the bit of a publicity drive, really, as we uh, really came out of the closet and became uh, a little bit more pub- public about what we're doing. So, posts on, on LinkedIn, starting to post out to LinkedIn groups as well, um, and uh, that sort of area. So, um, submitting the uh, the blog, which obviously tracks this podcast uh, to a couple of uh, blog aggregator sites in the big data world and uh, a couple of things like that as well so um you know really sort of starting to uh starting to drive quite a few listeners back to us now so which is which is nice to see and um the thing that uh, Jon was mentioning is the fact that we are now on iTunes as well we we waited until we'd built up a bit of a backlog so people could uh um, listen to a couple of them and uh, you know see if they thought it was their thing or not. Um, iTunes itself does seem to be um, one of the locations that many people go to uh, to discover podcasts. And in fact, there's a couple of other systems that uh, use the iTunes uh, podcast database backend, even though they, they front it with something else instead. So it was quite, a, quite an important push for us. And uh, Jon did all of the uh, master trickery required to uh, get that all up and running. So three cheers for Jon. Well, thank you for that. But it's more of a just knowing which tool to use to make it easy on yourself. <laughs> hey, that's that's half the battle. Um, so, yeah, we, we are now live. Uh, we are officially out there. And uh, if you've been following us from the beginning, then uh, please send us an email and tell, you, tell us how you were the first people that ever listened to us. Uh, we'd love to hear that. Um, uh, and of course, there will be a, a small group of listeners that were pre iTunes listeners. Um, we'll have to come up with a contest of some description. Um, uh, and also um, spoke at um, a training day for a global systems integrator uh, where they basically had all of their um, big data focused people from across Europe um, and they took over sort of a major hotel. Uh, near Heathrow Airport um, with a whole bunch of sessions uh, throughout a couple of days Uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to speak and demonstrate uh, at one of their sessions so packed room full of people Um, lots of uh, really interesting questions as well it was uh, their this particular SI uh, SI systems integrator in this in this particular case um, is more focused on the, the the business problems that big data is solving. So they're not really a technology focused SI. They're more of a um, a sort of a, a business SI. So they're focused on the analytics, um, the, the the business problems that these analytics can help organisations solve. And uh, so some of their questions were quite interesting, coming from a a different angle than we than we sometimes get. We sometimes get sort of people, um, as I'm sure you know, Jan, uh, very focused on the technology. 
Uh, but actually, it's what the technology can deliver that's the most interesting thing. So, yeah, really good session, really really well received, and uh, had some great feedback afterwards. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to more of that. Yeah, the best conversations always happen when we have both the technical and the business at the table, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't have that, then, uh, you know, also I think you're, you're kind of missing missing a bit of a trick because if you if you have the business behind you and, and pushing forward on these things, you know, the it's amazing how much technology that unlocks uh, but if you if you don't have uh, if you don't have that sort of backing then it doesn't matter how sort of how good your uh, good your ideas are um, it'll it'll really struggle to to be successful so yeah you're absolutely right the the, the more aligned you can get the business and the tech groups the, the better it will be yeah it's the thing that moves a hobby project to a real production enterprise level project yeah definitely all right, so that's uh, that's my last two weeks. Uh, anything else from you, Jan? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we'll wind up this first section and we'll come back with our second section, which is all about data ingest, how to get your data into Hadoop. Back after the break. Welcome back. In the main uh, topic of uh, this show, we thought, Dave and I, that since we had the excellent interviews from Joe Witt in the previous episode and the one that's coming in the next episode, to go a bit deeper into the other kinds of data ingest methodologies that exist out there, the different tools available. Uh, we're not going to go into any real depth on each of them because that would just take too much time, but just to have an idea of what's out there, what you can use in what situations. It sounded like a fun idea, so we just went ahead with it. Now, on the most basic level, of course, any Hadoop system has the Hadoop client that has the Hadoop file system put uh, command, which allows you to simply add uh, data to a, a HFS file system. Uh, HFS file systems also these days, usually in end distribution, have a NFS gateway that allows you to use it as this kind of a uh, drop pocket. And if you're a techie, you know about the distcp command to just copy a full HDFS file system to another location. But those are just the real native tools. And in a normal production flow, in a normal uh, flow of data transformation, whatever, there are a lot of better tools that are suited to better uh, better tools that are suited better to certain situations. So, Dave, why don't you start with the first one? All right. So the first one, and probably the Easiest one to, to get started with, I would probably say, is something called Scoop. Uh, so Scoop, that's S-Q-O-O-P, actually stands for SQL to Hadoop. Um, and pretty much as you might expect from that, it's actually for connecting relational database sources uh, into Hadoop. Um, so there are actually uh, quite a number of other connectors that are based on Scoop also available. So if you've... Uh, uh, got a, a Teradata EDW, Teradata produce uh, the Teradata connector. Uh, if you've got an Oracle uh, RDBMS, there's actually an Oracle R connector um, that uses uh, Scoop under the covers as well. And, you know, the only real differences between the upstream Scoop and, you know, things like the Teradata connector um, are pretty much that, uh, you know, they come supported by that particular vendor. Um, so many of the optimizations, uh, you know, eventually make their way into the uh, into the upstream open source project as well. So it used to be that uh, you know the forks were quite different, but now, as at least as far as I'm aware, uh, a lot of the optimizations are actually in the upstream. So really, your choice as to which scoop based connector you want to use is really a question of who do you want supporting your scoop, um, assuming that you have support uh, for your Hadoop environment. So Scoop is, uh, you know, pretty much limited to SQL sources, um, but it is uh, very, very easy to use. Um, essentially, what you can do is you define uh, a query that you want to run against your source database, and uh, that information is squirted through Scoop and landed into um, some form onto the Hadoop environment. So, you know, very, very easy to use. Anyone that can understand, uh, you know, some basic SQL can understand Scoop. Um, 
the 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 main issues with it are it's it's not really quite so good um, if you're doing lots of parallel ingests um, against a, a single data source. And in fact, one of the the key things to be aware of is that you will almost certainly have to uh, rate limit it in some way, shape, or form because it's very very possible um, and you know scarily easy if you've got a large Hadoop cluster to actually use something like Scoop to eventually denial of service uh, your source database if you're not careful. So take a look at some of the the, the rate limiting uh, methods uh, to make sure you don't do that. Um, and there's a number of different uh, options there. So that is Scoop. Uh, anything to add, Jon? Uh, no, I would, just, uh, I would summarize it as easy to use but limited to SQL only. So not much flexibility, but easy to implement. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Yeah, absolutely SQL only. Uh, but it's, it's great for SQL. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's great for that particular purpose. If you have SQL on both sides, there's no need to go anywhere else. Absolutely. All right, so next one, Jan, over to you. Well, we're kind of dealing with these options in uh, more complexity, uh, growing ascending order, I guess. So the next one in that uh, part would be Flume. Uh, Flume's been in Hadoop since forever, I think, in the days of Hadoop 1. I already talked about Flume, I think. And Flume uh, has nothing to do with SQL at all. SQL doesn't really come into this at all, even though you could just copy files with it. But it's basically intended for tailing a log file or tailing a directory, which in Linux, of course, is also a file, which means it simply will notice when a new file is created and then do something with that file. Different from the Scoop uh, product we talked about earlier, this is a bit more complex to set up because it contains three distinct components. You have a source, a sync, and a channel that connects uh, the source and the sync uh, together. And typically, you will install these parts in different locations. Your source uh, component will be on the, the creator of the data, where the data gets made, gets created. Yeah. The sync will be pretty much close to your HTTP system, to your Hadoop system, close to your HFS file system. And the channel in between is more of an uh, abstract issue. It could be a channel just through memory, or it can be a disk uh, uh, temporary directory or something like that. But you do have a more of a client-server thing here. Now, this is basically just a message bus. It doesn't interpret anything. It just takes bytes from one end and shuffles them over to the other side. Uh, if you have any kind of uh, protocol conversion that has to happen, no way. It just needs to uh, go through there. The only way that I know that you can give some kind of metadata that's intelligent is by using the uh, Avro uh, file format, I think. So basically, that's how it works. Uh, advantage, it's still easy to install. It's been around since forever, so whatever you want to do, probably somebody has done something similar before, and you can just steal from what they... Sorry, borrow what they did. <laughs> There is some limit transformation possible through some adding tags or there's some regex matching using a certain library. The name escapes me now. Maybe Dave can chime in if he knows what it is. Uh, flexibility is limited. It's very rigid. Once you put it up, it runs until it dies. It does have the exactly once guarantee, which basically means that any piece of data will go through the... Uh, source channel sync uh, sequence exactly once but there is a possibility of data loss if you're using the memory channel if you're not using memory channel you're adding additional latency which will slow things down so it's a bit of choose your evil there um what else to say um not much really we do see at least i do and uh, Dave, please let me know if you see anything different. But I do see my customers um, reaching the end of Flume, uh, where the flexibility, where the throughput possibilities aren't really keeping up with the data that's being created anymore. And I see more and more customers actually migrating from Flume to something new like Kafka or NiFi, of course. Um, today, if a customer asks me what they should be using for ingest and they're talking about Flume, I always kind of uh, not warn them, but make them think about the future. Is Flume going to be enough? Because it's always annoying when you set up a certain process that works and then you have to rebuild it because you hit the walls at some point. At that point, if you already know it's going to happen, it's better to just use Kafka in the first place. 
but uh, well, Kafka is on the is the next one in line here, so I'm not going to elaborate too much about that. Um, anything else to add on Flume? Anything I missed? Um, the only thing I think is is the um, the transformation library you're thinking of, is that morph lines or is that yes. something else? Okay. Yes, morph line. That's it. Okay. Um, and the only thing, only the other thing I was at because uh, it's the kind of nerdy thing that uh, that amuses me is Flume is named after log Flume, as in the ability to transfer logs um, through a water channel. So yeah, that's that's why the 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 log Flume logo is all over the Flume uh, website and that sort of thing. I did not know that. Nor did I know that Scoop came from SQL on Hadoop. I always explain to customers it's SQL oop. <laughs> no, no, SQL two Hadoop. <laughs> Sorry. Scoop. <laughs> no problem. All right. So final, uh, uh, final major ingest uh, environment that we're going to be talking about is Kafka. Um, so Kafka is a, a distributed uh, public subscribe message system. So it's a, it's a JMS message queue that has the ability for you to designate uh, producers of content and consumers of content, and that content is is pushed through the uh, the Kafka cluster. It's very much been designed from the ground up to, to scale. I mean, it came um, initially as a project out of LinkedIn. Um, and uh, if you're in the in the tech world and, and dealing with LinkedIn invites every 30 seconds or so, uh, and that's happening across their entire database, I'm sure you can imagine some of the things that, uh, that they're using it for there. But it, it really is... Um, it's designed for, you know, quite frankly, enormous scale that most people very rarely um, even touch. Um, it does have, uh, you know, it's, it's incredibly flexible um, in terms of how you can uh, how you can use it, but you probably will need to at some point uh, write some of your own code, and that's going to be in Java. So, good to, if you're planning to get in depth into Kafka, it's good to have some uh, Java developers within your uh, organization. Um, so one of the things that it's able to do is you have you know multiple providers um, pushing messages into uh, multiple partitions uh, that are all organized by a topic. And you can increase the throughput of the platform uh, by using multiple parallel topics as well. Um, there's no um, exactly once um, guarantee, uh, but again, uh, there's also uh, very minimal chance of any sort of data loss. It's uh, it's quite I/O heavy um, as a as a system, and in fact, uh, you'll quite often see Kafka being paired up with uh, Storm if you've got some complex event-based processing. Uh, and this is because uh, while Kafka is very uh, I/O intensive, it's it's fairly light on CPU, whereas Storm typically is quite heavy on CPU and quite light on disk I/O. So depending on your needs, you know that might not work for you. You might need to to have that separated out into different environments. But you know, depending on your particular usage, you might find that those two uh, components um, you know coexist quite quite happily together. Um, you know. Other people, uh, if you're already using something like ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ and you're very happy with it, then you know there's there's no reason not to carry on using it. Uh, you may, however, find that you're maybe reaching some of the the scalability limits of those platforms, uh, and you know that's definitely one reason to start maybe considering Kafka. Um, Kafka, you know, the final point I would probably make about it is it's often used in combination with something else. So, um, you know, Kafka in itself would probably be feeding into, you know, maybe a very simple uh, storm topology that is just feeding the data into HDFS or maybe feeding data into a, a flume sync that is putting the data into HDFS. Or um, there's actually a, an API that's also come out of LinkedIn called Camus, which is uh, great for feeding data directly from um, Kafka into HDFS. So it's usually used uh, in combination with with some other technology, uh, but it's without a doubt um, you know one of the the main methods that are used for uh, transporting data like that. Anything else to add on Kafka, Jan? Um, I'll just add that uh, yep, sure you have to develop your own uh, producers and consumers perhaps, 
But on the other hand, Kafka has been around for a while as well, so there's a good chance you'll actually find something already out there if you're just trying to put it uh, onto HDFS or HBase or Hive. I think there are already uh, consumers out there that can do help you do that. Yeah, it's a pretty mature e ecosystem for it. That's definitely true. The one thing I have noticed, though, is that because of the topic having multiple partitions, some of my customers have tried to build really complex workflows in there that they don't understand anymore after working on it for two weeks, trying to prioritize certain events based on certain tags. And that's basically not how you should look at these things. The partitions are there for parallelization, so you can have a certain topic spread across multiple servers, so you can have more throughput. It's not really an intelligent messaging system, is it? No, you're right. And, you know, really, that, that's, where, that's where something like our, our next topic would come on to. So, Jan, our next topic? Well, next topic, you mean the next product in the ingest tree. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, of course... Nifi. Uh, we talked a lot about Nifi already in a previous one, and we'll talk more about the next one, so we're not going to talk too much about it here. But uh, you're right, the whole thing about having a more intelligent workflow, if that's really what you need, then you should just pass on uh, Kafka and go to Nifi directly. And that being said, uh, a lot of the discussions I'm having with customers today is is Nifi good for everything? Should I still look at Flume or Kafka? Or should I just go with NiFi always? What do you think? I think that um, I think it's it's a difficult question to answer a, a simple answer for everybody, like a lot of these questions. But I think that NiFi is definitely uh, it's caught up the imagination of a lot of people, um, and I think it has a lot going for it. the the vis The visual experience that it gives you, the ability to uh, track what's happening to your data is incredibly powerful and really that's something that none of the tools that we've talked about have have any kind of uh, ability to do so that's definitely uh, pretty impressive but that being said um, you know some people have already got um, you know environments uh, built in Kafka that they're quite happy with and there's no reason not to use uh, you know NiFi to, to feed to feed Kafka it has a, a Kafka processor and in, indeed NiFi can even read from Kafka as well so uh, that's that's another option uh, so I think it's there's no there's no one size fits all for everything you know some people um, are perfectly happy um, with uh, a simple level of uh, ingest using something like Flume, and it does all they need at, at the level of complexity that they're happy with. Um, and if if that's the case, then then more power to them. But I think, uh, yeah, I think as as you said, we we've, we've talked about NiFi a lot in the previous episode. We'll be talking more about it in the next one, and I think we can certainly say that uh, that's where I think the majority of people are starting to to look very very hard. Yeah, for me, the, the, actually, the, the, the best benefit from Nifi for me is the fact that it's so easy to understand the flow. With Flume and Kafka, you build it, it's all CLI, it's running in the background, and there's no real easy visualization where you can see how you built it. So you make it today, in six months' time, you come back and you really have to scratch your head again and, why did I do this? How is this? And in Nifi, if you look at that schema on the, on, on screen, it's just there. It's visible. You can actually see how the data flows, and it's very easy to pick it up again. For me, definitely because, just like me, you as well, I think, we see a lot of these streams for different customers, and they're all just slightly different, of course. It's very hard to get back into a certain proof of concept. How was that set up? And with Nifi, I don't have that problem. It's much easier to just look at it in one one look of an eye, blink of an eye. You can see how it looks, see how it flows. Yeah, that's what I was doing. You have the self-documenting stuff with the colors and the text markup you can put on a NiFi schema. That, for me, is one of the biggest advantages for NiFi just as a uh, yeah, pre-sales engineer, let's say. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, some of the, just a, a quick uh, dusting over some of the uh, components that you talked about towards the start, Jan. Um, you know, Hadoop FS uh, minus put, uh, the good old Hadoop FS command line tools. Yes, you can uh, ingest data use that. You know, yes, you could write a script that does a whole bunch of um, listening to a file system and Hadoop FS putting stuff when you see it hit there. And, and in fact, I, I know that a couple of people, that's how they start out. Uh, it's it's really not it's not an ideal way to to 
perform in jest. It's quite slow. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a little bit ropey. But if you've just got a couple of files, a couple of smallish files you need to put in, then actually that might be you know a perfectly uh, adequate way to do that. Yeah. yeah, basically those tools have their own use cases again, right? If you're doing things like disaster recovery and all you want to do is copy the file system, then yeah, this CP will probably make it easier than to use Scoop for the databases and Flume for the files and Kafka for something else. NFS gateway. Specific use case again, FS put, I guess it's good when you're doing hobbying and testing stuff out, but it's not really something you want to have in scripts and cron jobs or something. Not ideally, definitely. <laughs> um, the only thing I, I would probably add to this is, you know, if you look at something like Falcon, for example, you know, a lot of this you're going to want, if you, especially if you're using uh, like something like DiscP um, to replicate data um, from a, an active site to a DR site, for example, then you're probably going to want to automate that using uh, using something like Falcon, uh, and so that can deal with things like um, you know, expiring data after a certain period of time or transferring data after periods of time from cluster A to cluster B. So you know, there's there's a couple of additional tools that can wrap around some of these. Yeah, but if you're using Falcon, don't you also have to drag in Uzi? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, but of course, Falcon. Uh, the nice thing about Falcon is that it does abstract away a lot of the Uzi madness. So, yeah, Uzi. Mm. Yeah, I have to do an episode on that one, but not right away. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's an episode where we should get a guest to do something. <laughs> that would be good, yes. Have somebody else explain why Uzi is perfect. Absolutely. Um, I'd just actually like to make a quick point about the NFS gateway. Um, the NFS gateway for Hadoop generally is is not really all that great. Um, it, it's a, it's a bit of a kludge, and really, if you if the the um, NFS gateway is going to be your primary method of ingesting data, then you probably want to look at something like uh, like MapR, who do have you know native NFS uh, support for their underlying. A proprietary file system or you want to look at something like uh, EMC's Isilon that has a whole bunch of different traditional file system gateways including NFS uh, and Samba so you know those are those are a couple of options if if you're looking at uh, that method of ingest um, so nothing else from me anything else you can think of to wind up, wind up the topic of uh, data ingest on Hadoop no, I think we covered pretty much everything. And as I said at the beginning, we're going to have to go in more detail on each and every one of these in future episodes. But as a general overview, I think uh, this should be pretty good. So that's it for the main topic of this episode. Uh, after the break, we'll be back with uh, listener questions as usual. Stay tuned. <laughs> In this last section of the podcast, we answer questions received from you, our valued listeners. If you have a question you'd like to an- like us to answer on the podcast, please send an email to podcast at roaringelephant.org, use our Hadoopcast Twitter handle, or go to our website, www.roaringelephant.org, where you can find out more information about this podcast and the contact form where you can submit your questions. So, first question, Jan, over to you. Okay, first question for today is um, a listener. He asks, I want to transform the data to its final form before it lands to the Hadoop cluster. What ingest tool should I use? Well, it's a good question. I've heard it a lot of times, and the basic answer is uh, none of them. Because data ingest tools do data ingest. They're not ETL tools. They don't transform data. Now, we did talk earlier about Flume being able to add some tagging, some IP addresses, geolocation stuff. That's always possible, of course, but that's not real transformation. The only tool that gets close would be NiFi that has more intelligence where you could do a little bit of transformation on it. But even there, I would usually say don't go there. Just ingest the data using an ingest tool and then use the real ETL tools like a Hive or whatever you're using to do the transformations you need. Yeah, I mean, uh, really, if you're if you're d- doing it that sort of way and you want it transformed in its final form before it lands on Hadoop, then you know you're you're doing the traditional uh, ETL engine, so you're probably pushing it through 
I don't know, a separate Informatica cluster or you know, one of the traditional uh, ETL platforms. Um, but as, as Jan said, really, ideally, you would ingest that data in its raw form and then use something like, you know, like Informatica actually on the Hadoop cluster itself rather than uh, pre, pre-transforming it. But, you know, some people, that's how they want to do it. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, next question. That's yours. All right, next question. Um, what about XYZ vendors Hadoop data loader ingest tool? Um, lots of different, um, lots of different vendors, um, ISVs have uh, their own Hadoop uh, loading tool of some description. And you know, if if that's if you've got you know every other bit of software that that uh, that software vendor has, and all of your data is in that particular format, and they have a uh, a certified, that's important, certified Hadoop uh, data loading or ingest tool, then, you know, there's absolutely no reason not to use that. Um, what I would recommend is, you know, take a look at the cost for it. Sometimes uh, these tools look and sound great, but are actually fantastically expensive uh, for the amount of functionality they give. Um, so, you know, yes, um, you know, it might take a bit more time and effort, to actually learn one of the ingest tools that we were talking about in the second section of the podcast here, but it might be significantly cheaper than uh, one of your standard uh, software vendors' uh, approaches. But you know that time, uh, that budget might not be int- important to you. The time might be very important to you. So in that case, um, yeah, go ahead, take a look at it, see how it works. Okay, next question. Do any of these ingest tools, whatever I'm using, are they running on my Hadoop cluster, on my Hadoop nodes? As we've said often in this podcast, I think the most magical phrase, it depends. It all depends what you want to do. If you have, like Dave mentioned earlier, a Kafka storm combination, for example, it's a very good marriage to have both on the same uh, nodes because of the usage of disk by one and CPU of the other product. Things like Flume might fit better on an edge node. Uh, they will be part of the same cluster, since uh, both Kafka and Flume and Scoop can be uh, installed and managed by a uh, Ambari uh, instance, for example. In that case, it will be on the same cluster. But you simply have to take a look at uh, the, the uses, the resource uses of your nodes and see if they have space for it. Basically, all of these ingest tools need CPU power and need disk access, some more, some less and just see if you have space for them and uh, place them where you like. The only exception, I would say, is NiFi, which at this time isn't integrated in any kind of uh, global management tool, so that will probably still run separate, logically separate in a cluster. But physically, since NiFi is very low uh, footprint resource-wise, you could probably still uh, co-locate it on a Hadoop node somewhere. So really it depends on uh, what you're doing, how much data is being ingested, and uh, how busy your Hadoop cluster is. Any comments? No, I think that's uh, that's pretty accurate. Um, you know, the the un- only other reason why you might uh, you might have these things uh, might be looking at these things slightly differently is, you know, they're they're part of the overall cluster. It's all managed by Yarn. But you might also have different hardware profiles. So your your standard data nodes, you know, are going to have a, a regional a reasonable amount of uh, CPU and probably quite a lot of um, average speed disk. Uh, but maybe certainly if you're um, having um, some data nodes that are dedicated to Kafka and Storm, you're probably going to have quite high spec CPUs and um, pretty fast uh, spinning disk for that. So, you know, the, I think the having different uh, profiles and splitting those out using uh, Yarn to make sure that that's uh, taken care of uh, makes sense too. Yeah, very good point indeed. Okay, you've got the last question, I think. I believe so. Um, so the, the, the final question was, how does this kind of um, data ingest um, all these data ingest topics fit in with um, a, a Lambda architecture. So for those of you that aren't familiar with it, Lambda architecture um, describes uh, a system consisting of you know, three main layers. So you've got a, a batch layer, which is you know, used to handling large quantities of data. So you, you would do your um, large volume historical processing use that. 
You also have a, a speed layer, something that is responding very quickly um, to, uh, you know, preferably near real time or near real time um, to queries. And you've got a serving layer. Now you could have two different serving layers, uh, one for the uh, one for the batch layer and one for the speed layer, or you could have a common serving layer. So uh, an example of this is uh, where you've got a a source, uh, a data, a message queue, or something like Kafka or NiFi. Inserting into the batch layer, which would be sort of HDFS, and you know you could potentially be querying that using uh, something like Hive. Um, but similarly, you would also have that also feeding into a, a speed layer, uh, which would be feeding into something like Storm or Spark or something else. Um, and maybe that would be storing its information into uh, Cassandra or HBase. So, you know, data ingest obviously plays a part of that. That's, that's where you're sourcing that information. But uh, don't forget that, you know, with a Lambda architecture, typically you're ingesting that data into two different locations um, into that um, into that batch layer and into that speed layer. So make sure that your your overall ingest framework is able to uh, not just put data into one location, but have it thinking about putting data into multiple locations. Well, that is about all the time we have for today. We do hope you have enjoyed this serving of bite-sized big data. We'll be back in two weeks' time with a new episode where we have the second part of the interview with Joe Witt, where he goes into more depth and detail on Apache NiFi. Don't miss it. Until then, please go to www.roaringelephant.org where you can find more information on the podcast. Send us your questions and please give us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps new users to discover this podcast and broaden our audience. If you, for some reason, don't think we deserve the full five-star review, that's okay too, but please do contact us via the feedback form on the website or via email to podcast at roaringelephant.org with any thoughts, comments, criticisms and other feedback you might have. Until then, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you in two weeks' time. Goodbye. Take care.